is. So the thing about this writing system, it's not going to be a boring lecture with lots of horrible facts, but there are a couple of important facts. One of them is this, that about 3,500 BC, which is more than five and a half thousand years ago, these people who lived by those rivers in Mesopotamia came up with the idea of writing. And the principle was that you made uh, characters in a very simple fashion, rather like a child would draw, because that would depict what you meant. So if you look at the top left-hand corner, you have a an ear of barley with some numbers. Circles are numbers. And you can understand straight away that it means such and such a quantity of barley. So already you are fluent in the cuneiform writing system. In fact, this isn't quite cuneiform. It's before cuneiform. It is called pictographic writing. The reason being that the scribes using their stick from the riverside and the clay from the river bank drew with a point in the clay what they wanted to communicate. So the one below shows a man's head and a bowl of food, and those two signs together uh, write the word for um, rations. So in the Sumerian language, in the Sumerian language, the word for barley and the word for rations existed in their tongue. So when you first started out writing, you did a picture or something. Well, uh, that was just a picture, but you can't really do writing with that. You can't explain anything complicated. You can't explain anything complicated. So the script exploded in a very brilliant way from just simple pictures to being able to write sounds. And that is the most important contribution, in my opinion, that was ever made in the history of Homo sapiens. Because moving from childish drawings like that to signs written on a tablet where the words and grammar and ideas of a message could be recorded so that another person could read them and people like us 5,000 years later could read them made history itself possible. This was the first time that it was possible to record information for the future so that people could make sure the information and experience and know-how wasn't lost. So you see in the blue chart how the signs, they changed a bit. They started out like five-year-old drawings, then they lay down on their sides, and then in the end they decided not to draw them anymore, but to use that stylus, the, like a chopstick, to press into the clay to reduce the signs to straight lines. So you can see if you look at the orchard one, there are lots of little lines to show trees standing in the water. But by the time it evolves to the proper cuneiform shape, it's much different because all the lines have become straight because they are written in this funny way. If you've never seen one of these things before, it might strike you as very bizarre, but as a matter of fact, when the jump was made from little pictures to proper writing signs, it became possible for people who were trained to record their own language and other languages too, as we will see. So when you wrote a cuneiform tablet, you had a bit of clay, you had your writing stick, and this is a drawing from a, a children's book, which shows the position of the hand. It's in the left hand and the writing stick held firmly in the, uh, in the right hand, and the individual strokes, the upright lines and the ones at an angle, each applied with the tip of the writing system. Now, when the Sumerians made the jump to writing, it looked at the time like a very big jump indeed. They had two basic tricks. One is called rebus, which means to do with things in Latin. And rebus meant that you could use a picture to write a sound not meaning the picture. So, for example, if you imagine a bee zzz, and a leaf, you put them together and you can say, oh, this is a bee on a leaf, but actually bees usually go in the flowers. So what does that mean? But it also you can read belief, the word in English, which has nothing to do with leaves or bees. And this was the brilliant conception that you could take all these signs, which were just pictures, and use them in a much more fluid and complicated and brilliant way to spell things like that. They're a bit like puns. And at the same time, they had another brilliant idea, which is if you had a word that was a syllable, then you had a whole load of syllables. So the word Z might mean just one thing. But of course, if you drew the thing, you could use any time you wanted to put the sign Z down, you drew the thing. So if you wanted to write museum, which of course is a very important word, then you'd have a sign that went mu, one that went Z and one that went um. And you write them together spelling museum. So if you did that, a Sumerian who'd never even been to London would identify with a label that the British Museum was a museum. Now, the funny and ironic thing is that on the London Underground, if you sit in your seat and look at your fellow man opposite, you often see people with a mobile electronic device and a writing stick, which they hold in exactly the same way, and they do exactly the same thing as a cuneiform tablet. And those phones are made to fit in the hand, they're the right size, so were those clay tablets thousands of years before. And the other point, which is worth bearing in mind, that people who use these devices often don't bother with grammar or sentences or all the important things that writing allows, but they write things like the Sumerians did before and later are a kind of device that any Sumerian would immediately recognise. So I have to show you portraits of the kinds of persons. The oldest language, the first language we see on these clay tablets from the very beginning are the Sumerians. This is a Sumerian priest. It's a pious man with large eyes and large ears carved in stone and he spoke the Sumerian language. He's in the British Museum and it's a great pity that he will never answer questions or smile back or make any response at all to any curator who lingers in front of him confidentially wanting to ask a question because we would have many questions for a Sumerian like this because the language that they spoke is not like any other language that's ever been discovered. 
It's not related to any kind of language. It stands on its own. And when you first study it, it is quite strange and quite bizarre. And all the words that you know in the world and all the language things you've discovered and all that, none of it's any use. It's a quite different thing. So it's rather interesting that the first writing, I mean, rather the first language that we have written down is not like modern or even other ancient languages at all. It's a rather special thing. Then the second one is what we call Akkadian. And what you've got here is a wall painting of an Assyrian scribe. And you can see he has a tablet in one hand and he's writing sticking the other and he's there writing out a document. And the thing about him, he spoke Akkadian. Akkadian is also extinct and it came along a few centuries after Sumerian. They both lived side by side in ancient Mesopotamia. There were two languages going on. This Akkadian language, although it's dead, is closely related to many languages that do still exist. So, for example, if you speak and read Arabic or Hebrew or um, Aramaic or Ethiopic, any of that family of languages, you would understand when you saw some Akkadian written out in English letters that it was a sister language and you could understand how with time you might get the hang of it. So there are two completely unrelated languages, Sumerian and Akkadian, written in the same cuneiform writing system. So when you see a tablet, you have to work out which language it is. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about school. And then after that, I'm going to tell you about the sort of things that people who learned to write did in the course of their lives. Now, the first point is, and in the modern world, one has to make some kind of apology for this. Um, it was really only boys who went to school to learn to write and only from certain families. So you didn't have a situation in that remote antiquity where everybody was literate, only a minority. So it's a funny thing to visualise that when we look at these documents, when we put together in our own minds a kind of summary of their thinking or what their ideas were, the only people we can communicate with are people who'd gone to school and learned to write. Otherwise, there would be a chilly silence. So when you went to school, probably about five years old, you had to learn how to make a clay tablet and you had to learn about a writing stick and then you had to learn the signs. That's quite a lot, quite a lot indeed. Now, if you see on the left, you have a round... Um, rather it looks if you put it in the oven and baked it it might be quite tasty you have a round tablet with writing on both sides and this is an interesting thing because when you if you were a boy who went to school um, the classroom wouldn't be very many children probably at once six or seven and they might be of assorted ages so when the younger one a new recruit arrived what would happen is the bulk of the teaching to which he was exposed was carried out by one of the older boys not by the master so the first thing you did is you got some of this lovely clay and you rolled it into a ball and then you flattened it to make one of these small cakes. And then the older boy took his writing stick and he ruled lines across the surface. And then the signs were hung, impressed on the, on, on the tablet, hung from the line, a bit like washing. You can see that each sign has its head tucked on the writing line. So the older boy would write these lines. In this case, it was a proverb. And the younger boy um, would look at this very carefully for some time until he thought he'd remember it. And then he would turn it over and from memory, reproduce the same inscription on the other side. And what is interesting is that we have quite a lot of these tablets, and sometimes there is the most alarming discrepancy between the writing on the good side and the copy. Now, we know quite a lot about what went on in the schools. One of the things that went on quite regularly was that boys who didn't work properly were beaten with a stick. Rather a good educational system, in my opinion. So uh, you, the master might be violent, or he might be ironic, or he might be uncomfortable, but he was the authority. And if your copy wasn't good enough, you'd have to do it again, but you might also get into trouble. Now, on the right here is a photograph of another round tablet. It's a close up on a drawing on the surface. There's no writing here. And if you look at the lower left hand corner, you can see the curve against the background, which shows that it's a close up of a big, bigger round thing than we can see on the screen. The reason why it's a close up is this. If you look carefully, you will see it's a huge face and there are two features about the human face which certainly need to be concentrated on one of them is the hairs sprouting out of the nostrils in a rather weaselly and unpleasant sort of way and then if you look below there there's a very very small curved mouth of disapproval at the bottom so this drawing which was done in about 1750 bc in a classroom is obviously a caricature of the teacher and it's in fact the oldest caricature known in history it's quite remarkable and you can immediately tell a whole lot about the classroom that there were rebellious boys that there were boys who much rather be outside mucking around in the water and enjoying themselves and sitting in a room and learning these confounded signs one after the other for years on end and perhaps this boy had been soundly strapped and was feeling resentful and he got his own back by drawing a cartoon and probably passing it round to ferment rebellion in others so the point here ought to be emphasized is that with a slight dollop of imagination you can take some bizarre thing like that some unexplained thing like that and look at it in such a way that the life which can be in, with which it can be imbued becomes very vital and the principle is that it's not 
somebody sitting poetically making up something about an old object just to make just just to show off the point about it is that the interpretation is compelling from the thing itself it means that there was a relation in the classroom that there was boredom there was frustration there was hard work and there was a good bit of ability to produce such a cartoon in such a way that the message is clear to us i think it's a really marvelous object so if you became one of these scribes there were basically two different directions you could go in one was administration and the other one was what we might call um, intellectual if you'd like to call it that we'll come to that in a minute so the administration was a very serious matter because at the time this tablet was written for example which is about 2100 bc the temples in the different cities were entitled to have um, material livestock and barley and all sorts of other things delivered for their needs on a very regular basis and at the gate of the temple complex there were scribes who had to write every day lots of these receipts such and such an amount of barley was delivered by mr so-and-so so-and-so was in charge and this is the date and it's sealed and it's a kind of receipt a statement that this delivery had been made so you've got four of these on the side there are lots of them in many museums they're all about an inch square, something like that. And, and sometimes they're, they're very easy to read, sometimes not. But side, on the side, you have a ledger in many columns of writing, which is a summary. Anunnaki gods carried torches of fire, lightning, scorching the country with brilliant flashes. The stillness of the storm god passed over the sky, and all that was bright then turned into darkness. So this process of deciphering fragments, of identifying the text on them, of putting text together from different fragments and finally getting lines that can be translated, goes on and on for every part of Gilgamesh and indeed for every Babylonian narrative poem and all other uh, literary compositions that are part of the stream of tradition that the Babylonians passed down and the Assyrians passed down. And gradually through this process being conducted by a very few people around the world, we are recovering the oldest literatures in human history, the Babylonian literature, the Sumerian literature before it. But it's painstaking work. It's very rewarding work. And we begin because we can understand this poetry, not only to hear it this aesthetically, but we begin also to analyze it and see how it's structured. And Babylonian poetry is rather carefully structured. Each line is usually a statement or two statements. We haven't got long sentences that go on forever. I was reading Charlotte Bronte's Villette the other day, and there's a sentence in there which goes on for a page and a half. <laughs> but you can't do that in Babylonian poetry. A sentence will normally stop at the end of the line, or at the most go on to two lines, but very often a line is two statements. But the first and the second statements kind of support each other. So we see here, this is about what happens when the storm hits the rivers. It uproots the mooring poles and the weirs overflow. And then we get the lightning gods coming, carrying lightning and scorching the country. And then we get the storm god, this calm before the storm. The stillness passed over the sky and it all goes very dark. So the ideas are carefully separated in the poetry and we get moved through it through a process of short statements, which are often are bound together in pairs. And I want now to go on to have a look at the poet's art just with a couple more examples. Uh, this one is the seduction of Enkidu, and if you remember, the way that Enkidu was got from the wild into Uruk to become the chum, the, the friend of Gilgamesh, was he was seduced by a prostitute. And this is Akkadian, I won't read it, but you can see that I've made bold some nouns in it which are important in the way that the poetry is constructed. And if we look at the translation, the same nouns are here, also uh, separated from the main text, but by colours. And this, again, is poetry which is carefully constructed so that the first two couplets are the coming together of these two people, Shemchet, Shemchet the prostitute and Enkidu, it to have sex together. The second set of two couplets, four line passage, is actually the sexual intercourse. And then the third one, again, two couplets, has something else happening. So in fact, we're seeing kind of verses. The interesting thing is that here, Shemchet unfastened the cloth of her loins, she bared her sex and he took in her charms, so she takes her clothes off. She did not recoil, she took in his scent, she spread her clothing and he lay upon her. So they now come together on the ground, on her clothing. And then she did for the man the work of the woman, his passion caressed and embraced her, that's to say, the intercourse starts, and then it lasts for six days and seven nights. Enkidu was erect as he coupled with Shamchat. The way that the poet has organized the text is that Shamchat occurs there and there, and Enkidu is sandwiched between, because his entire concentration, his, his, his mind, his senses, are all, at that point, concentrated upon the prostitute. So here he is, sandwiched between Shamchat, and he hasn't a thought for anything else, a glance for anything else. He's absorbed entirely, with the prostitute. But after the intercourse has stopped, when with her delights he was fully sated, he turned his gaze to his herd. These are the animals he grew up with in the wild. The gazelles saw Enkidu and started to run. The beasts of the field shied away from his presence. And if you look here again, Enkidu is sandwiched this time, not by the prostitute, whom he's had enough of, but by the animals with whom he grew up. His herd called here the beasts of the field as well. So it's a mark of a very careful poetic organization. And uh, Babylonian poetry is like this. It's very formal. It has a particular way of, of, of telling narrative in short statements, but also more complex things happen 
so that here we can see that the poet has thought very carefully about where to put the name of Enkidu. Not here, but here. An old Babylonian example is, is this, this uh, tablet from the 18th century BC, joined from a piece in the Berlin and a piece in, in the British Museum. They were put together in 1994 when they were allowed to kiss, just briefly, at a conference in Berlin. But then this piece went back into the pocket of the curator from London and was taken home again, and they are now divorced. But this is a passage in which Gilgamesh reaches the end of the world, and he meets an alewife who asks what he's doing, and he says, explains, I've got to go and see you to Napishti because I want to become immortal. Where is he? Can you help me get there? And she says, don't be silly. No one's ever done that. In any case, there are better things to do with your life than go on a mad quest for immortality. Why don't you make merry each day, dance and play day and night? Let your clothes be clean. Let your head be washed. May you bathe in water. Gaze on the little one who holds your hand. Let a woman enjoy your repeated embrace. For such is the destiny. The text now runs out, but it must be of mortal men. And the fourth line of this verse, the second line of this couplet, is lost. But again, we can see in play, the ideas come in two line couplets here. Make merry, dance and play. Keep nice and clean. Enjoy the company of your family, for that's what you've got to do. Good advice. And this is actually one of the most famous bits, I think, of, of, of Gilgamesh, not only because it, it, it's such a beautiful little picture of, of domestic harmony and simple living wherein lie human happiness, but also because it's so like a passage in Ecclesiastes. Now, another thing I like about this is when it says, gaze on the little one who hand, gaze on the little one who holds your hand, the Akkadian is subi sekram sabitu kartika. And I don't know whether I'm the only person in the world who thinks that in the sound subi and sabitu, subi sabitu, there's little kissing noises, because you kiss your babies when you bounce them on your knee. So that we can, because we have the vowels and we have the words, we can understand and appreciate aesthetically the Gilgamesh epic. It's more than just a story. We can appreciate it as well, not just for what it tells us in terms of a narrative, but also in terms of the way it's structured and the sound of it, which is a wonderful thing to be able to do. He's done his bit. He's exhausted. He's stopped. Anich Ushubshoch. Tired, but at peace. Nothing more in his life is going to happen. He tells his companion, go up onto the wall of Uruk and observe there the city. And what do you see? You see human life. And the curtain comes down. And that's it. The poet is saying, yes, individuals go on their great quests. Sometimes they get what they want. More often, they don't get what they want. And all of them have to come to terms with the great fact of human life, which is human death. All of us. But there is another life of humans that is not individual. The life of humans that is communal. And we must remember that Babylonia is not a modern Western country, instilled with the notions of the freedom of the individual that so inculcate our culture. It, our culture is about the individual, the rights of the individual, the place of the individual. I think Babylonia was a more Asian place. It was more, the idea was, we're a community. We belong as part of that community. We have to act within that community. And what this poet is saying is, the individual is a mayfly who dies without trace. But human life, as represented by the city, where you can see all human life, goes on forever. So I think we have got, then, a message from the poem. I don't think the poem was created to give us that message, but I think the interest of the last poet of Gilgamesh was very much in using the story of Gilgamesh as a vehicle for understanding the human condition. And out of it, then, we get this idea coming very strongly that what the individual does is not important. The important thing is the community, the society of human beings. And I think it's this, not only this idea, but also the, all the other ideas in the poem about what it is to be human as opposed to being an animal, what it is to be human as opposed to being a god, what it is to be a king. All these ideas demonstrate a, a great intellect at work who knows how to embed thoughts about the human condition into a great story drawn from folklore. And this, I think, explains why the great epic of Gilgamesh, 4,000 years old, when it was rediscovered and became known generally to more than a seriologist in the early 20th century, it took off and took on a life of its own and has been the inspiration of artists and musicians and librettists and dramatists and poets who have not stayed faithful to the epic of Gilgamesh but created Gilgamesh among us. And, of course, a seriologist hate this because we think we are the gatekeepers of the epic of Gilgamesh. And if you are going to engage with the Epic of Gilgamesh, you should do it through our work. But of course, it's too late. The cat got out of the bag a long time ago. Thank you very much for listening. This is a difficult act to follow. I'm Peter Machinist, one of the local